The Star Wars saga is so full of incredible and iconic moments that it's easy for many of them to go underappreciated, but I'm not gonna let that happen. Starting with The Phantom Menace, this series will be taking a deep dive into the three best moments from every Star Wars film and analyzing what makes them so perfect for both the film itself and the Star Wars saga as a whole. I'm Dylan, and this is The Writer's Block. The first moment I want to analyze is the lightsaber fight with Darth Maul. No, not that one. I'm referring to the duel on Tatooine. All things considered, it's an incredibly brief fight, but its significance is unmatched in the overall saga. As Maul himself puts it, this is the moment where at last we will reveal ourselves to the Jedi. At last we will have revenge. For a thousand generations, the Sith were assumed to have been extinct. Thanks to the rule of two, they were able to keep themselves concealed and bide their time until they were ready to strike. This is that moment. Everything Palpatine had been so patiently planning is put into motion with one attack. As for the duel itself, it perfectly captures how underprepared the Jedi are for the Sith's return. Qui-Gon is able to momentarily hold his own, but only to the point of buying himself time to escape. When he jumps back onto the ship, he's visibly out of breath and clearly confused as to what exactly just happened. The idea that the Sith might have returned is so far from his mind that he even assumes that Maul was trained in the Jedi arts. Some wonder why Maul doesn't use both his blades here, and in addition to making the later reveal that much cooler, it can also be attributed to the fact that he's initially toying with Qui-Gon. He doesn't want to reveal his full strength until he gets a sense of how powerful his opponent is. If the fight had gone on just a minute longer, Maul most likely would have ignited his second blade and made quick work of the most underrated Jedi Master in all of Star Wars. If we look at the prequels as a criticism of the Jedi Council's hubris, this is also the first time their supremacy is questioned. Sure, they're a force for good, but they assume that they're the dominant power in the galaxy. This, along with a number of other factors, is what allows them to be overthrown just a few years later. What culminates in Order 66 begins right Right here on Tatooine. Also, the fact that this sequence ends with Anakin's introduction to Obi-Wan makes it that much more poetic and significant. Speaking of Anakin, the second moment we're looking at today is Qui-Gon choosing to take Anakin as his Padawan. When our squad of heroes returns to Coruscant, Anakin is immediately tested to see if he is a viable candidate for Jedi training. Despite his innate connection to the Force, council members such as Yoda and Mace Windu sense fear and and a palpable darkness within the young boy. Despite the fact that he may very well be the chosen one, the council is wary of accepting him because, as Yoda puts it, I sense much fear in you. This, once again, speaks to the hubris of the Jedi Order. The prophecy states that balance will be brought to the Force, but they mistakenly assume this means an absence of darkness. In reality, there will always be darkness in the galaxy, and the dark side of the Force is not inherently evil. The Council shuns Anakin rather than offering to help lead him down the right path, which is a major part of why Palpatine is so easily able to corrupt him. The only person not not afraid of Anakin's darkness is the Jedi Maverick himself, Qui-Gon Jinn. This is why he so readily questions the Council's judgment and offers to take Anakin on as a Padawan learner. Moments later, Qui-Gon comforts Anakin by telling him to remember that your focus determines your reality. This one quote single-handedly encapsulates the main theme of the prequels. The Jedi Order are so focused on suppressing darkness that it ultimately leads to the creation of Darth Vader and the Galactic Empire. Conversely, Qui-Gon accepts the darkness harbored within Anakin and chooses to focus on the hope and good in him. I truly believe that if Qui-Gon had survived to personally mentor Anakin, the fate of the entire galaxy would have shifted dramatically. But unfortunately, you know. <laughs> 
After the death of Qui-Gon, it's up to Obi-Wan to take over as Anakin's Jedi Master, and this leads us into the final moment we'll be delving into. Just barely granted the rank of Jedi Knight, Obi-Wan meets with Yoda to discuss the future of the young boy from Tatooine. Yoda informs him that he personally disagrees with the choice to train Anakin, but Obi-Wan doesn't care. He gave Qui-Gon his word, and will follow through on it whether or not the Council approves. This is such a fascinating bit of screenwriting because it reveals so much in such a short amount of time. A lot of people forget, but for most of The Phantom Menace, Obi-Wan wants nothing to do with Anakin. He questions Qui-Gon at every turn, and regularly sides with the consensus of the Jedi Order. However, when Qui-Gon begs him with his dying breath to reconsider, Obi-Wan does not hesitate. Whether or not he agrees with someone, Obi-Wan is a fiercely loyal individual, and we'll see this even more later on as his relationship with Anakin evolves. What's more is that this beat emphasizes just how young Obi-Wan is when he's forced into the role of mentor. Qui-Gon speaks highly of him throughout the movie, but it's a huge jump to go from Padawan to Master. As dedicated to this position as he is, Kenobi is not necessarily ready for this much responsibility, which explains why he struggles to keep Anakin in check despite his own professionalism. It's made clear that Obi-Wan and Anakin are like brothers, but what Anakin needed was a father figure, especially after being ripped away from his mother. This moment is key to understanding the isolation Anakin later feels, and why Palpatine positions himself as the parent he never had. If the Jedi Order had more faith in Anakin, then perhaps Obi-Wan would have had the support he needed to properly guide his apprentice to maturity. But as it is, Obi-Wan was set up to fail from the very beginning. I'm sorry, Anakin, for all of it. There are dozens of great moments in The Phantom Menace, like when that frogman holds up that big orb, but these are the ones that stand out to me as truly perfect. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe to see the next entries in this series as they come out. I'm Dylan, and this has been The Writer's Block.